Well, hello, everybody. This is Joseph Land. Welcome to my show on January 23rd, uh, 2023. Can you believe we're almost through the first month in 2023? I think the older I get, the faster time goes. But anyway, I'm excited about today's program uh, because I have one of my favorite uh, entrepreneurs on the call with us today. And I really want her to just take this and run with it. But I want to I want to give you an introduction on her. She is a she's a rock star. I talk to her a lot. All, I talk to her all the time and weekly, as, as a matter of fact, too. But she uh, remember me telling you guys that people always remember a story. I can sit down in a boardroom and I can go over the numbers, uh, soup the nuts. And when we leave there, uh, some people will remember, but most people won't remember. But if I tell a story with the numbers, everybody remembers the numbers, right? And so this, this lady that you're going to hear today is, is, uh, is the consummate expert storyteller. And she does this, uh, she helps she helps corporations tell their stories so that they're more effective. Not only that, she has her own business. She, she is an amazing entrepreneur and she's crushing it. She is absolutely trust, crushing it. So please help me welcome my friend uh, and Jennifer's friend, uh, Angela Moonen to our call today. Angela, welcome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, this is such a kind introduction. I'm glad we recorded this because whenever I have those bumps in the road, I'll go back and listen to how you just introduced me. This is very empowering. Thank you. Well, you are a total rock star and we're excited to have you on today. And so many people can learn from you and what you've done and what you've been through and how you've been successful. And so I'm going to get out, hold on. I'm going to get out my notepad. Everybody get out <laughs> your notepad. And uh, I'm going to take some notes because because she's got some great advice for us today. So Angela, take it away. Well, thank you, Joe. I, uh, as I look back on my life and I think about the master storytellers that I have had the good fortune of crossing paths with, uh, I've worked with a gentleman now, uh, um, a Canadian, eh? And we've worked together for, oh, 25 years. And uh, one of the things that he has taught, he's a master storyteller. He, he wrote content for the world's fair, some of the world's fairs. And um, he's written for Inuit tribes who have kind of lost their way and their chiefs have come to him and asked him, could he help, help them remember who they are? And and so I, I've had that model. And I think one of the things that I want to stress today is um, finding models of excellence. They made all the difference for me. Um, you know, we sometimes make assumptions, especially if you're bright and awake. And I know we're always getting more and more awake, right, on this journey. But if you're bright and awake, you, you understand the importance of surrounding yourself with really good people. And what we sometimes forget, though, because we're so bright and awake, is that we make assumptions about, um, about getting from point A to point B. Well, if I do this, then this, then that, then it'll all add up. And what I'm here to tell you is that learning from others who've gone there and done that, they're not you. There's no other Angela. <laughs> I'm it. Um, but the patterns and the challenges and the guideposts that they've used are all so important. I know I, I work well when I can emulate something. If I have something in front of me, it's always worked so well. I don't know, raise it, you know, raise your hand if if you can relate to this. That well, show me how it's done. If if I can see how it's done, then I'm a pretty quick study. I'm a good student, and um, so I think that the primary one of my primary messages today is to surround yourself with people who have who are wonderful people, spirit centered, God centered people, um, mindful 
that um, how we treat one another and who we surround ourselves with matters. And then look for those models. And it's always, um, I, I think it, on some level, you must all understand that. And that's why you're here. And that's why you spend time with Joseph uh, as well, because he's an excellent model. And knowing how to find those complementary models too, I think is important. Not necessarily getting stuck in one pattern. I think points of view are really vital, particularly in today's world. You know, people kind of get stuck in their point of view and not leaving space for other points of views and perspectives. And Joe and I do talk a lot, um, you know, and, and I defer to him often on things. We don't necessarily, it isn't as though we agree on 100% of everything. That's not it. You don't want that, right? You don't want someone that just agrees with everything that you say, because <laughs> you can tell that yourself that story. So, so there was a, there was a gentleman that I started working with to talk about story and he had risen through the ranks of corporate America. He had um, gotten more and more stuck in the office, in the corner office and less and less time out with the people. And, you know, he said, I just don't feel in touch. <laughs> I don't feel in touch with my employees. I don't know that I feel all that in touch with my our customers. Um, and, and truth be told, it's always what is happening outside of us, right, is always a reflection of what's happening inside. So he had lost his way. And it's that's, that's why we have guides and guideposts, because it's very easy to do that. But when you know when to come back, how, how to come back to center, how to rely on the people that are around you. So he and I work together. Um, we've been working together now for Gee, almost 15 years. And uh, he sat down, I shared this story with Joe last week. We're, po we're positioning him to sell his company. It's very hard for him to do. It's a, so, such a large part of his identity. And um, first he was going to sell it in, uh, I'm going to sell it next year. And then that year would come. So uh, I'm going to sell it next year. And then that year would come and it's been going on for about six years, <laughs> about the half the time that we've known one another. And he, he, we said, I was up in New York with him this past week and he says, time to meet in person. So I knew that he was, you know, he's been readying himself. And um, he said, I, I want you to know, you know, I'm, I plan to, when I sell the company, I plan to uh, bring you in on that sale. And, um, recognize and reward the efforts because we are here where we are because of you helping us and me personally define what we want for ourselves, why we're doing what we're doing, where we're headed and what this is all about. Um, so my, my advice is <laughs> from, from my humble perch in the world is that, um, that writer friend of mine, the Canadian gentleman said to me, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. And so I, I encourage you to continue to find and refine um, and, and be willing to let go of those people who may have served you and you may have served them at a particular time in your path, but be willing to let that go if it no longer is perhaps the best solution for you and be willing to step into spaces like this where um, like-minded people can support you on your path. So with that, Joe, do you have thoughts or questions that, for me? That's, ex that's excellent. Now, now the gentleman, um, Angela, Angela does a lot of, uh, business with people in the financial sector and the insurance sector and various things. Uh, she also has, has her own brand. I, I want to make sure I give all y'all her information and I want you to make sure you follow her uh, on her social media pages. And I want to make sure you uh, follow her with what she's doing in her personal branding. But, um, you know, he, here, here's a guy who's the CEO of a company for a long term in the insurance sector who tells her, you know, hey, 
had it not been for you and this 15 year relationship and you posturing us and encouraging me and helping me think out of the box and do some things, you know, creative things that have really made our company successful, then we wouldn't be where we are today. Now, what a tremendous compliment, Angela, that is to you uh, from one of your clients. It is, and, and it's an interesting path um, that I've taken because I, I started in marketing and media, and then I, I found through time, and I started, I started with this gentleman's branding and marketing, and then over time, as the pace of change sped up, and the world of consolidation in insurance, just like in all professional services and pretty much anything around the world is about consolidation now, um, as that landscape kept shifting more and more rapidly, I saw the, the less and less certainty in his eyes when I would meet with him or speak with him on the phone. I could feel the, the strength and certainty dissipating. And so I found that no matter the, the marketing stories that we told, if it wasn't emanating from a, a place of strength and certainty within him as the head of the the, the, the dragon, if you will, as, that, as the leader of the company, then everything else would be uphill. So, so I started to realize I could be all the things I wanted to be and profess my, infuse my sense of certainty and belief about your inner faith, your faith, your trust, your discernment, um, kindness, compassion, empathy. If I could, I couldn't necessarily come right out and talk about those things directly without lexicon with him because insurance is, <laughs> well, first of all, it's not exactly the most stimulating <laughs> subject matter. It's insurance, right? Uh, and so I understood his mindset was so different from mine. So what I did find was common ground. And I would encourage you, each of you to, to reaffirm this for yourself is that those basic essences that I just spoke of, all human beings desire. It doesn't matter their title. It doesn't matter how successful. Um, they want to feel certain. They want to feel empowered. They want to feel smart and, and, and savvy. They long for those things and they long for connection. And the higher you go in an organization, the, the less and less connected you can feel because you tend to, human nature is tending to, it's there's this guard or protection of, because I have to separate myself from the employees. And so we, we I, I began more and more using the stories that I was crafting very mindful of the words and language, tone and tenor of what I was writing for them, from his speeches to his presentations, his packages that his sales development team would put out, just very mindful of how all of that integrated so that day by day, it might not have been completely conscious for him every day, but he felt more and more supported and more in alignment with what he truly desired in his, in his heart, beyond the, beyond the balance sheet, if yes. you will. Yeah. Beyond the balance sheet. Gosh, that's a great name for a, <laughs> right? a beyond, the for the <laughs> beyond the balance sheet. Beyond I like the balance that. Sheet. Yeah. I like that. So we, it, and really that is what it is. I mean, they can, ha he can hire anyone to come in and talk about valuation and, and, you know, times cash flow and his EBITDA and all that. He can, he, he's got people, very smart people around him about that. I understand that because I have to at least have some kind of appreciation for that when I'm in conversation with him. But really my role with him is to clarify and refine what it is that he wants and needs, and then how do we articulate that? First for him, so he can believe it and live it, and then so that his people can emulate him as an example. Amen. That's that's beautiful. Um, I love I love what you're doing. You know um, the old saying: uh, when you're working inside a company, uh, or when you own a company or sizable company, uh, the old saying 
people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, right? People, uh, when you're working in a culture, you want the people to know that you care for them, then they can hear your message more clearly. You know, oh, if, yes. You I mean, know. without trust, without yeah. that trust um, and, and certainty about um, where this person sits in relationship to me, what is it that she wants for me? If you don't believe that, then um, that's, yeah, another uphill <laughs> battle. So, yeah. Well, Angela, uh, you you also do a lot of work. I'm, I'm looking at my screen here and I see Jerry Llewellyn uh, on this call today. He's an advisor to uh, law firms and doctors and people like that. So, Jerry, I know you're you probably have a couple of questions that you want to ask Angela, but uh, but you two uh, do similar things, although um, a little different. But uh, Jerry, do you have any question you'd like to ask Angela at this point? Well, first of all, I just want to say how privileged I feel to be on this call and to receive the message that's just resonating in me. It's like, oh my God, this is real stuff. You know, I, um, so real stuff because people, when they align, you know, they just can do something spectacular once they are aligned. And without that, they're just kind of all over the place. So I guess the question that I would ask you um, and because of your discussion of how faith, trust, um, discernment, compassion, and empathy are there within you, those are the values that you uh, are connected with within yourself, but you have to form a dialogue outside for, you know, your client so that you can link up. Uh, and so uh, tell me, give us an example, if you will, uh, of, of that, of how what the story might be for an individual, where he was, right? Mm. And you, you mentioned the doubt and the uncertainty and the clouds and so forth, but tell us that, that how you built the story and what that story was that that individual was able then to light up and move forward. Interesting. Yes, I will. I will um, see if I can find a link and I'll put in the chat, Jerry. There's, a, you know, there's a saying that, there's really nothing completely new in this world. It's just a, 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 a reframing of something and making it your own. And so I look to those models of excellence and to me, the finest model of storytelling, I follow that model and that model. And I, why I'll clarify and qualify why I say it's the finest model. In Hollywood, there are people who put millions, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars on the line all the time to produce a movie. And if you want to talk about an industry that has been turned on its head in the last 36 months, that's it, uh, the movie industry. And um, yet there's one company, I mean, there, and there are failures all the time. There was uh, one of the ones that was just, it was nominated for a Golden Globe but it failed miserably, Babylon failed miserably at the box office. And I think the budget for the film, Jerry was like 70 million or $80 million because of all the big names that it put in the movie and the sets and the costumes and the, and it, it's, I think it, it's grossed 15 million. Mm -hmm. And after two or three weeks, you've got, you, know, you, we in the consulting business, we have some time to have some proving ground, right? A movie has a proving ground of maybe two weeks. So it's the, one of the riskiest industries out there. And yet there's one company who's never had a failure ever. And that's Pixar. So I went and visited, uh, I got behind the scenes tour, in San Francisco, um, maybe three years ago, four years ago, I had looked at the Pixar method of storytelling for a long time. I had been curious about it because I'm like, tell me about this. These, this is a company who's never had a failure. Why? Because they follow the formula. They follow the formula. They have a system. They understand the hero's journey. They understand we all are our own hero in our own story. So when I start, I, I use the Pixar, if you literally can pick that up uh, by Googling it, Pixar storytelling structure, system, framework. 
Um, so I use that as a foundation for actually building the story. What I ask business owners to do or individuals, because I, co I coach individuals as well, not just companies. Um, what I'll ask them to do is to take a look at, I'll do a little ex a visual exercise with them. Now, if I determine that they are more auditory thinker, there are some signs that I can see as someone a visual thinker. They look up a lot. Um, they look to the side. If someone's an auditory, someone will literally turn their head because they're listening, they're thinking. They're, they we do is all of our portals for for thinking, right? But there's a primary or dominant thinking system, and um, if someone's kinesthetic thinker, predominantly kinesthetic, they feel, they make sense of a story through their senses and their body, their physical presence, they'll look down to their tummy. It's just, or they'll move around a good deal while they're listening to something because they're using this as their mode of understanding. And um, so in this case, this gentleman was visual, which, 65% of the world is the primary thinking system is visual. So I showed him an archetypal wheel. And this is all based on Joseph Campbell, his method of storytelling. It's all mythology. It's all, it's it, because we're all hardwired in our DNA. We are hardwired for story, beginning, middle, end, hero, villain, you think of Star Wars, for example, and you think of the impact characters like an Obi-Wan Kenobi, but then you have, oh, and your Yoda, he's the sage. Yoda plays the sage archetype. Han Solo, the, re the renegade. You know, Luke Skywalker, the hero, and Darth Vader, the villain. Um, so every story has those things. It's hardwired. It's baked into, the, in, into our DNA. That's why story works. So... Um, I'll show, I, I show him the wheel and ask him in the characteristics of each, there's the jester, the lover, the sage, the caregiver, the rebel, you know, Harley Davidson, for example, is bases everything on the rebel. Um, and ask him, where does he see himself on that wheel? And that informs me a lot as to how he views himself. No title, no industry, none of that stuff gets in the way and clutters up his belief system. I'm just asking him a simple question. If he looked at himself, where would he see himself on that archetypal wheel? And that's where I start. Is that helpful? Well, more than helpful, it's just awesome. So, uh, <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, just good. awesome. No, you, no, no. You, you, you've. Uh, what you've done is you've. Uh, you had the intelligence to go find it. I mean, that was what was is brilliant, is that you saw something that you needed and you analyzed it and picked the people that had not failed. I love it. And then you found out the strategy and you, you know, I, I don't know if you did. You say Carl Jung's name with the architects. Where, uh, where did you get the archetypes from? Our archetype is Carl Jung. It's okay, also so Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Campbell uses it a great deal in the hero's journey as okay. well. He talks about the, the different archetypes that can be exemplified. And we all have different attributes. It's a fun exercise for each of you on here. If you have never done it for yourself to go there and to take a look at that archetypal wheel and say, you know, where am I? Am I empress? Am I, where, where am I on, on that wheel? And it helps us define how we would also like to be seen in the world. You know, you want those two, of course, to, to be in alignment. Who am I and how do I wish to be seen and how are people seeing me? Um, but it also is a mentoring tool because it helps you discern maybe where you are not living up to your potential. Because if you really in your heart desire to be the sage, the oracle, the person that that's oracle, I mean, that's literally the company, that's the archetype that the oracle brand takes. You wouldn't name yourself oracle if you didn't want to be viewed that way, right? So um, it, it, it helps you define where I am 
and where I'd like to go? And then what's the story that I can begin to craft for myself and to share in my content, to share in videos that I put out. And you know, if, if you have defined that as your brand, your personal brand, um, your soul brand, <laughs> if you want to talk about that beyond, you know, the commercial aspect of it, how you want to live your life, then you get to look at that and say, well, in what areas in my life am I not living that? Wow. Um, so and sad. it's worthy to strive, you know, do I want to strive for that? It gives you kind of your North Star, I think. In a way. So I am tracking this at, a, at an incredibly deep level and just think what profound profundity, Joseph, you brought into the circle today. Uh, but I want to ask, can you give us, I know we could spend hours and hours, but can you give us a small example of a story? What architect, archetype the story, you know, is driven around and what's the actual story that uh, uh, any of your clients might have embraced that represent what you just described? Well, I'm going to let Joseph talk for a moment and then I'll do that. Yeah, oh, <laughs> let me give, me, give me a second. This is so amazing. Jerry, I knew you were going to be stimulated by this conversation today. <laughs> she is a master at what she does for corporations. And, uh, and I'm so proud of her and I'm so proud to introduce. And you can employ some of this in what you do. So Angela, go right ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm going to apply it to rather than do you want now, Jerry, let me ask you, do you what do you wish for me to apply it to someone you wouldn't necessarily know or like a client a customer situation? Or would you prefer to have me share an example of that with something that everybody would know? Uh, I'm happy for it to be something that everybody knows. It's just that I would, I would, yeah, I, I think that okay. would probably be helpful. Okay. Yeah. So, so once upon a time, there was a professor named Indiana Jones. As a boy, he started out as an adventurer. And he was always curious about artifacts and the stories that went along with those artifacts. And he never felt like he was quite living up to his dad. So he would often get in trouble. He'd kind of get out of line. But as he grew up, he realized that he could do both. He could be the professor in the classroom and he could also go on these amazing adventures and integrate the two where he would bring back these treasures and he would share them with his class. And, but to some degree, there was always this renegade rebel in him, right? That um, he loved being the hero, but on his own terms. There were a few things he was afraid of, like snakes. <laughs> um, and he had wonderful support system for people who could help him on his quest. So he would leave the comfort of his classroom and he would head out into the sand dunes of Egypt, ancient Egypt, in search of things like jewels and statues. And he would get in trouble along the way and run into lots of villains and people who would want to try and get the statue in front of him. And the greatest treasure that he sought was a treasure his father had sought all his life. And um, the Ark of the Covenant and the Grail. And he went through so many trials and tribulations to get to the point where he found out the Holy Grail the treasure of all treasures was guarded by a knight and he needed to, he was being chased. He needed to cross this chasm in order to get the Holy Grail. He knew it was right over there, but there was between him this massive chasm. And he thought, well, what do I do now? I know it's over there. I know exactly where it is but I don't see how to get there from here. And for the first time in his life, 
he had to let go and he had to trust. And so what did he do? Do you all remember what he did? He's at the edge of the cliff. He stepped out. He closed his eyes, took a deep breath, and he put his foot out. And what happened when he put his foot out? The bridge appeared. The bridge appeared, yeah. The bridge appeared. That's faith. That's trust. And it's symbolic of all that is, right? And then when he gets, he goes, he cries, he says, oh, I got it. And he runs across. And there is the Knight Templar guarding the grail. And he's got to, and of course the Germans come in and he's got to pick one out. He's got to pick out because his father, um, if you'll recall, Sean Connery, he gets shot by one of the Germans. So the only thing that will save him is the grail. So he's got to pick the right one. And if you pick the wrong one, life is taken from you and not granted to you. So the Germans, of course, go for the shiny, sparkly, bejeweled, thinking that's a king's cup. And the German drinks of it, and what happens? Takes life from him. So then Indy, knowing his history, calling on all the things that he's learned and what his father's taught him, it would be a carpenter's cup. It would be a simple cup. And they pick the right cup, and he saves his dad. And he's the hero. He's the hero. So that is the hero's journey where they grow up, they have an adventure, they have aspirations, they have some challenges and faults along the way. They're not perfect. They have their fears. Um, but they, there comes a point in their life where they have to trust and they have to have faith and they have to put their foot out. And I use that story and that metaphor of putting your foot out when there isn't a bridge, um, I use it all the time and people get it immediately. Trust, that's what trust is. That's what faith is. Trusting in something you can't see, but you believe is there. And so you do it anyway. That's beautiful. Isn't that a great story? I love that story. It's one of the finest storytelling structures of that and star wars et there's a, it's the best place the best place to learn story is through movies um for that, me that that's really what works beautiful. for me really beautiful jerry how did you like that well i'm just sitting here to decide should i talk to the vibration that's within me right now but i'm just gonna be quiet and soak it in i'm just in love with this message thank you so much for bringing it today Don, how about you? Don, I see you right on the edge of your seat. That was an awesome, I was captivated by her even just telling it. So she's definitely a master. Um, <laughs> You're sweet. Really, I was just like, like I was in the, and I didn't see the movie. I, I only knew parts of it, but you showed it for me. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Um, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I could see the whole movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. I love it. I'm going to share something with you guys. Angela uh, has, has been uh, an advisor. Uh, I think that's the proper word. You know, she's more than a consultant uh, to a uh, fairly sizable regional banking institution. And uh, that bank uh, last year increased their deposits like unbelievable and uh, increase their customers like they've never done before because of what you just heard her helping them posture helping them realize who they are helping them define who they are helping them be who they are uh, it's just fascinating the gift that she has isn't that right Angela well, you know and there's another industry that is not exactly by its nature trusted or exciting, you know, it's not, um, it's not like a, a wonderful resort that gets to tell all these beautiful stories about its banking. So what we determined, and I just was in a retreat with them this past weekend that I helped conduct for in this region, 60 some of their employees. When we had bankers up building, we, we had, um, they built totem poles 
we built totem poles because totems are at the their essence, their story tellers. Totem poles tell the story of the tribe. And what the Spank has been challenged with, with all the AI and fintech and the competition to evolve digitally, et cetera, they're, you know, they're beginning to, to become more transactional than they are basing their relationships on connections with people, which is the very thing that has made them so special and will retain them as special. But it's easy, all of us, it's easy for us to get caught up in the technology and the pace of things. We don't wanna miss out on something. We feel like we've got to keep pace competitively with what everybody else is doing. But the things that will never be able to be conveyed by a robot is spirit, the divine. And so I can't go in and talk with bankers about divinity, but I can talk with them about joy. And I can talk with them about connection and what that connection looks like and feels like. So they, each of these seven or eight teams each built their different totems. And how you build a totem is that you pick a spirit animal that you off of this list that I provide each of the tables. And they wanted, by the way, they wanted to do, and this is a nuance, but it's all important. They, wa they wanted to do a classroom setting all weekend long, like rows of tables where people sat like this, and you've all been there. You sat like this and looked up at a screen. And I said, we can't, we can't do that to people. <laughs> First of all, it's not productive. Second of all, it just crushes, it crushes people. You'll lose them. You, 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 you know, people have the attention span of, so you put them in a classroom setting, they're just going to, they're going to, they're going to vacate on you. So we did round tables round circle so everybody was equal at the table and they could engage with each other they could work together in their circle and there's circle is very spiritual as you know as well so um they would build their totem and they would tell the story of their tribe and then the ask was all right now expand that one level out beyond your table tribe to the tribe of the bank as a whole and what you represent to your the communities that you serve. Um, they had a blast. They were dancing, they were singing, they were laughing, they were storytelling. And it's intrinsic to us all. And it connects us in a way that nothing else does. What is the Bible? What is, what is every ancient um, book of wisdom, but stories? So we did the totems and we did that. And, and these are bankers who um, they said they'd never experienced anything like this. And we did, I mean, we did many, I did many, I designed, I design a lot of videos and photography. I love photography, et cetera. And so I had crafted several videos throughout the day to share with them, to show them how wonderful and magical they really were. And loads of stories from real customers who talked about how the bank had made a difference in their lives, in their homes, in their businesses, in their communities. Over 400 volunteer hours had accumulated amongst some of the employees at the bank this past year tens of thousands of dollars raised to go back into the communities that they serve. But this wasn't, no one was taking a bow for this. No, no one was codifying the good works that they were doing. So, and we made a, a massive initiative, Joe, as well this year on their, um, their Google reviews, making sure that the online word of mouth that people were already naturally authentically saying about them actually got codified too, so that other people could learn from that and get testament that, oh, these people really do care and they really are engaged and involved and have a stake in the community that they're working and collaborating, creating with. So it was, it was a magical weekend. How, how many people could say they spent a magical, wonderful, uplifting weekend with 65 bankers? 
<laughs> Again, they're not not the typically the most dynamic of people. Um, it was it was off the charts. Great, terrific. That's amazing. You know, I'm sitting here thinking. <clears throat> One of the most difficult things a, a start out entrepreneur has to do is tell their own story. You know, uh, if I'm going to see a client and I'm just getting off the ground and, and I want to tell my story, I always, always wanted to know that if I had, when I was in the transportation business, if I met someone on an elevator, could I give them what I did before I got to the next floor, right? Yes. So, so many times, uh, for lack of a better word, we talk too much and we throw up on our client, our potential client, instead of giving a distinct message about what we do and why it's so exciting and why they might want to be a part of it, right? Kind of thing. Uh, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit, Angela? I can. Um, I work with clients on their, what we would call their 30 second elevator speech. And there's a formula for that as well. Um, I, I worked a long time early on in the industry and you'll all recall this and many still have it to this day. Well, they'll have two page, sometimes crazy, like 10 page mission statements and they would pay hundred thousand two hundred thousand dollars to have some company come in and work with them to write uh, this epistle <laughs> that a week later the the ceo couldn't remember so if you can't remember it what are the internally what are the odds externally anyone's remembering it and then beyond that who could ever repeat it i mean and have it really mean something yes so uh, there's, it, it used to be seven words on a billboard. You could get away with seven words on a billboard. Uh, and now it's down to five words, five words. And for brand promises, when I design a brand promise for a company, uh, maximum, I keep it to four words. Usually ideal perfect model is three words. Let's think of Nike, just do it, just do it, three words. Um, when this insurance company is in your corner, as an example, um, someone else's might be there for you, for the bank, it's for life's journeys. And then every story we tell, we use that brand promise as the litmus test. Do our, you know, because lots of people like to make claims. Do you demonstrate it in your deeds? in the stories that you share. So every story we tell, we test it against the promise and, and ask ourselves the question, does that prove the promise is true? If we tell that story, does that prove the promise is true? And if it does, it's the right story. If it doesn't, we gotta refine our story. So even before the 30 second elevator speech, I would submit that you start with your own brand promise and you can have one that's for yourself, I mean, there are two words that I think are a wonderful internalized promise, and that is I am, I am. Another is, could be, be the light. So you tell yourself every time before you walk into a room, into a meeting on one of these Zooms, be the light. And then every story you share Every exchange you have, you're tasking yourself to say and reminding yourself consciously to say, am I the light? And what does that mean for people? It means something a little bit different to everybody, I suppose. It's the most intimate question you can ask yourself. You know, how am I the light in the room? Um, so when I talk about elevator speech, I start simpler first if that makes sense, like three words, just think of three words that are your North star, your litmus test, and then build your elevator speech, your story off of that. Does that make sense, Joe? Yes, that's brilliant. That's brilliant because, because most people don't know what to say or what to do 
and they're afraid and they haven't done it before and and that that is brilliant you know that's a that's a great that's a great uh counsel uh jerry what do you think about that <laughs> well i continue just to be to marvel um i will say you know that reminds me of uh, edward bernays and his doors to the unconscious mind and it's clear to me that what you're doing just opens up the audience, whether it's an individual or a group, uh, to this tremendous opportunity to influence. And if you do it right, and you have them come from within themselves, they're going to explode with a sense of an empowerment. They, they will, Jerry, because that's the thing. I don't teach someone anything they don't already know. Somewhere within them, it already is there. We all begin in that place. Now, isn't that an amazing comment? That's exactly right. Where is so it? it's my I'm, role I'm just... to simply shine that light and to give them space to see and learn and know and make conscious that which formerly has been unconscious. Yes, and that non-conscious brain, right? Mm. Because, I mean, you know, particularly, I mean, any of the individuals on this call, as an example, if you are here in this sharing your time and energy in, in this space, you are an awake person. <laughs> you already have everything. You were born with everything that you require to fully realize yourself. And the journey is that unfolding, is that opening up. And so as a guide or advisor, um, I still say I'm so blessed, I believe, that my mother picked the name that she picked for me. Because between that and my singing, I mean, that's really, I wake up in the morning and jo Joseph has helped me really be learn to be consistent with this. Because consistency is another attribute, right? So we can know this and we can do this. Are we, are we enacting this consistently? And so. There are a few things that I do in the morning when I wake up, humbly pray that I may be the best, finest instrument I can possibly be for God today. Use me as your instrument. And then at the end of the day, humbly ask, did I do you proud today? And that, that's my that's my lit my own litmus test for did I get the most out? And some days, you know, voice comes back to me and says, you did all you could do. Um, maybe this tomorrow. So it's a self-reflection of um, your own expectation of the day, what you want to accomplish, impact, create. Um, and it's for me, the simplest way I can ensure I'm staying aligned with my purpose. I love it. I love it. Uh, giving God the glory and, and, and putting him first and thanking him at the end of the day. I love it. Who's blessed by this conversation today? Raise your hand. Wow. Uh, anybody have a question that they want to ask Angela before we go? She was very, uh, she was very kind to come on our call today, kind of at a last uh, moment's notice. Uh, but I just had this gut feeling that that we all needed to hear from her today. I get to hear from her every week, so I get this every week. But uh, before we go, I want to tell you how God has blessed her uh, with the new property that she purchased this year. Uh, and I want her to describe it to you in her own storytelling way. But when you go on her social media, you'll see a lot of uh, her photo shoots and video shoots and things of that nature have been done at this wonderful, beautiful property that God has blessed her with in this past year. Uh, Don, you raised your hand. You have a question for Angela? You know, she really, she just sparked something that I remembered. Um, I used to write country songs uh like 20 years ago i got really into it not the melodies because i don't play an instrument i write i can write poetry and stuff and country music songs are basically a full-length movie 
cut down. You had to learn how to put the whole movie in just four, you know, p- little paragraphs. Yeah, and two or three minutes. minutes. Yeah. And, and, end. and I write my poetry like that. I, I like sum it up. I start it and then there's an end and then there's a, but it's just, you just totally reminded me of that. Yeah, it was, it was. Profound. Yeah, and it's so important, I think, to express Dawn, I think that it comes out in different ways. Uh, there's, uh, I wrote country music for a long time, which is really oh, fascinating. Okay. Spent a lot of time in Nashville. And you, ha- uh, so did I. and you had a pet raccoon and so did I. You're the only girl. I, I had a pet. I did have a pet raccoon. raccoon. Like, so did I. I'm like, who else can, can I say that I'm, I never met anyone yet who had one, but now you. Yeah, he loved marshmallows. It's so funny. Um, yeah, lived out in the country when I was a little girl, and um, yeah, the animals were big buddies of mine. Any kind of animal, give me any kind of animal, and yeah, and, and my dad owned a sports store, so we were always around and big hunters and trap shooters. My mom, in fact, and my uncle were both New York State um, champions for trap shooting, so we were all just always around that growing up, and. Um, So spirit animals to me are a really amazing way. And that's, I think to me, you know, the totems are a very personal thing to me. I also find it, I find the, the path that native Americans have walked, um, albeit one aspect of it, quite tragic, another aspect of it, quite, quite, quite magnificent and beautiful. Um, There's a saying I want to share quickly, Joe to circle back about telling your story. Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain something simply, you probably don't understand it well enough yet. So I would would submit that. And then there's another that's, you know, that great artists say, you know, something doesn't become more beautiful because you add something to it. Beauty is about taking things away. In other words, creating more space, creating more focus in the piece of work, in the flower arrangement, in the backyard, in a painting. You've ever seen the woman that has, do I have, now I'm asking myself if I have too much jewelry on today, the woman that has too many accessories. There's just too much going on. So you don't know where to look. So the idea of when I, I had challenged my realtor, I have a home at the beach um, and I'm just getting ready to sell. And I, it was beautiful for me during the pandemic. I purchased it just before the pandemic hit. And it really, God being on my side, I purchased it in November, moved from New York, uh, purchased it in Florida here in November and the pandemic hit in March. And um, I was just in this beautiful little paradise bubble at the beach. And then after, within the last year or so, year and a half, I started to feel like this is quite remote here. I live at the edge. I mean, I'm at the ocean, at the edge of a preserve for 15, 20 miles preserve. So it's very quiet and very remote. And it's, I've got about 10, 12 minutes to get over to St. Augustine. Um, But between me and St. Hog, there's not a whole lot going on. So I challenged my realtor. I said, it's got to be something really kind of spectacular. It's got to be unique. I want to feel I'm more connected now. And so looked at many places. She sent me many places and no, 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 no. I knew what I was looking for had to be really standout special. And I knew that it needed to have gardens and a sanctuary almost feeling um, for what I wanted to do next. And just for my own being like, yes, I want to be at the edge of the city and I want to be more connected to people, but I still need that retreat kind of space. So to try and find that combination is rare. Uh, I walked into this, she said, you, it's not on the market. You have to come see this home. I said, but it's not for sale. She said, I know, but this guy is thinking about moving to Bali and he's thinking about selling, but it has to be to the right person. If he's going to do it because he's he so loved this place. Um, 
I walked in, I, I went left and I looked down this vista through these French doors out to this back oasis. And I said, this is it, this is it. So my place is um, in a really lovely little historical neighborhood called Avondale, sits on the St. John's River. There's literally a tidal creek that goes around two thirds of the property. It's a full acre in the city, which is really unusual. And when you're in the, when you're in the house, the brick house, when you're in the house, you can't hear that you're near a city. And certainly once you walk out into the back, we film our circle of life videos there. I've started to film some things there. Um, and if anyone on here um, does yoga or Tai Chi or anything like that, has a yoga platform that stretches out over the Tidal Creek, um, which is where we film has this beautiful, huge, larger than life statue, bird statue, color lady bird, um, fountains and I mean, bamboo, so much bamboo. And it's, and I have people who <laughs> I'm like, is someone, does someone come with the house? Because <laughs> I can't take care of this by myself. So I have really wonderful people that help me take care of it, but it is deemed a um, wildlife habitat by the city of Jacksonville um because of the ecosystem and because of what lives back you know i have owls and turtles and i have a koi pond it's just so it's my very special place and yes joe there are definitely um videos it's all new for me a lot of the social media and the uh i'm really i know it seems strange i'm really just kind of coming to the party with it for me it's like those old story of the cobbler cobbler's kids go without shoes. You know, I've worked on marketing and branding for so many others for so long. And I kind of just always putting myself last in that line. Joe has helped me, you know, establish that, um, yes, you know, you have a brand and we need to define that and make sure that you're taking a bow for some of the good works that you're doing. So you have, a that, huge, Joe, I'll over to you. <laughs> you have a huge brand and I, I love that story. And I, I was with you every step of the way with that that house, and I'm so proud of you. I, um, I, the other I want two more things, and I will let you go. Angela is a gifted singer. She has she's like Philharmonic Orchestra kind of singer. Uh, you know, I listen. I'm from the South. I don't know how to describe all this, but I mean, she's like Pavarotti type singer. And Angela, I want you to say a few words about that. And then I want you to talk about living well today. And I, and then we will, we will end this call. Oh, I'm just, I, I will do that. I'm just reading some of the messages in the chat. It's just, gosh, I mean, makes my day, week, month. I just love it. Um, thank you. Thank you for the kindness. Um, I grew up on the stage from the time I have a photograph and a recording of me singing a song. It had to be you. It was the first song I ever performed publicly. I was four years old. <laughs> my grandmother had me sing that song. My grandmother was a professional uh, jazz organist. And uh, just that was our thing. I would put her shoes that were too, although she wore a size five shoe. I remember that because by the time I got like 12 or 13 or 14, I couldn't fit in her shoes anymore. Um, and slosh around the music room with these big, dresses, costumes, and feathers, and whatever on with my microphone and singing all those old great American songbook tunes that I grew up on. As I, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I thought that I was going to do that. I was going to have a voice in the world and, you know, right every wrong kind of thing. <laughs> and um, I found out, I could go to school for music. I know it seems like so strange. Well, of course you can go to school for music. Well, I lived in a very small very, I mean, 1300 people in my town. I didn't know that I could go to school for music. And, and it was like this, oh, like this moment that all of a sudden I was like, oh, well, that's an, of course, of course, I'm going to go to school for music. The challenge, of course, is I'd never had any formal training and uh, really was a total fish out of the water. And um, so my grandparents made a decision. Well, if you're going to do this, we're going to support you. You know, success is never a solo act. <laughs> they, they made sure I got to Europe. I went to performing arts schools. So I spent the next couple of years catching up, working my tail end off 
uh, to languages and diction and just breathing and all of the technique that you need to perform at that kind of level. Uh, at this point, you know, by the time I was 22, I had performed at Carnegie Hall. I had performed at Notre Dame Cathedral and St. Patrick's wow. Cathedral in New York City. Um, just, I, I mean, major, major deal. And uh, I have found that even becoming a mom and then deciding I really wanted to make a mark in the business world, I've always fostered my singing. I've always kept it because it's so much a part of who I am. I've not always been clear on how to keep it integrated and not, you know, do CEOs want to know that their advisor sings music? I, those are the things I would ask myself and I would doubt myself or be confused on how do I be all of who I can be and not look unfocused or not look professional or in the eyes of these business owners, et cetera. And then I just finally made a decision because what I was seeing was that these business owners too had cut off some part of themselves. They felt they needed to wear a certain mask to work <laughs> and wear a different mask at home. That's right. Right? That we, we, keep, we guard and we live our lives in these silos separate from one another. So we never, hello, we never totally feel 100%. We don't feel integrated inside. So I said, well, I can't be talking about integration and alignment and be hiding this other little part of my life, which is not so little, over here to the side. Like it's, um, you know, horrible moniker to wear or something. So I just started doing it and I, I made, and I'll tell you here, here, here's how I did it. I went into the studio. I have a, a, a friend who owns an amazing, like Manhattan quality, LA quality studio in Syracuse, New York. And I do a lot of volunteer work. I have a, I have a, a, a charity. If any of you are interested in looking it up, it's a wonderful charity. I've had about 15 years now. It's called Music for the Mission. Dot org 501c3 we feed anywhere from 20 to 30,000 families a year feed or shelter we don't do the actual on the uh, you know on the streets work we raise money and awareness for those who are homeless or hungry uh, and music for the mission.org and i decided to do an album that all the proceeds for that album would go to musicforthemission.org and I would give it as gifts to, I would give the album as gifts to each of my clients. Wonderful. So I wasn't, you know, I just said, I think that's a way to begin. Just give it as a gift and, and let people know. And it, and I read, oh my God, I didn't know. Blah, 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 blah. And I did the CD as a story. So all of the musical selections, Joe, that I picked told us, part of the story of my life. And then I wove it together with speaking in between the songs on the album. Cause I thought they know me as a storyteller. They'll appreciate the stories. And there were great stories. Every song was picked for a specific reason, triggered a certain memory, put it all together. And, and then, and I never looked back from it. Now it's right out up front. It's on my website. It's, and I found the common denominator story story yes. and i yes. and i would encourage you if you feel like you have parts of your life that you're living in silos and they're not fully integrated find there is obviously you are the denominator you are the denominator you the hero in your own story but but for me i know finding that connector which was story allowed me to frame it in my own mind with confidence and be able to convey that to clients and feel like it would be congruent for them. They would get it. They could understand it that way. That is beautiful. Thank you for that explanation. Also, uh, you can uh, contact Angela at AngelaMuna.com. Is that right? Angela Muna. That's right. Yeah. My email is bloom, like the flower, at AngelaMuna.com. So bloom, B-L-O-O-M, 
at AngelaMoonan.com. Bloom at AngelaMoonan.com. And then the yes. final thing I want to pull out of you today is living well today. How can people hear about that and what you're doing with that and be a part of that? Well, it's a it's a project of integration yet again. So I love photography. It is it's like Don's songwriting. It is one of those things that allows me to express in the world. Uh, if you want to see my photography, you can see it on my website by visiting there. You can also go to Angela Moon and Photography dot com. Many um, my, of my travels, Europe and et cetera, Italy in particular. Uh, where I'm going back in just a couple of months, I'm taking my mom. She's in there. That's our homeland and she's never been there. And we're going for a couple of weeks. Very exciting. Um, so living well today came out of this desire to um, show beauty and share beauty in the world in whatever form that means. Living well to me does mean are you surrounding yourself with beautiful people? And I don't mean literally, but I mean literally and figuratively, people who shine their light. Are So your relationships, you know, the big four that we all live our lives around, which are relationship, health, money, and work, our work in the world, career. So living well today also is going to explore... I think one of my colleagues called it the good morning of uh, good morning America, but with intentionality and spirituality woven into it. So we're going to have artists, creators, designers, people that express beauty in the world through their mode, though their modality, whatever that may be. Uh, so people who are in the healthcare space and doing really beautiful work. Uh, that's what living well for me is and how we, how we break bread together, presentation of food and wine and our beautiful spaces, because all of these things from your car to your home, to your office, uh, to your closet are an extension of you. And so they require care and time and energy and attention and love. So that's living well today. And our, my, our goal is, I believe that the channel is going to launch sometime around the end of this quarter, like late March, early April. Great. So. Well, everybody stay in touch with Angela Bloom at AngelaMoonan.com mm -hmm. and AngelaMoonan.com. And then you heard, um, you heard the mission. Is it the mission for music? Music for the mission. Music for the mission. Dot org. Yes. Dot org. That's beautiful. I love that. So Angela, thank you for joining us today. You, we, you are captivating. We have all oh, thoroughly so enjoyed our time with you today. You have been magnificent. I'm so proud of you and love you so much. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. And everyone, I want you to hang on. This ends our program, but I want you to hang on just a moment as I close us out personally here. <laughs>